Now, brain tumours are the most common cancer killer in people under the age of 40, but treatments have barely changed in years and research into the condition has been very limited. The issue was highlighted recently by the death of the singer Tom Parker at the age of 33. Well, now brain tumour patients at Adam Brooks Hospital in Cambridge here in the UK are having their cancer genomes, the entire DNA, sequenced. And the aim is that tumour mapping will lead to more accurate diagnosis. A warning, this report from our medical editor, Fergus Walsh, contains images of brain surgery. I've got a rough idea of what's going to happen. I'm going to be partially awake, but I'm going to be woken up during the surgery. Daniel is just 34. He's on his way to theatre for brain surgery. I think that's the bit I'm most scared about, is being awake and having someone smooting around in my head. Daniel has a large brain tumour, the round white area at the top of this scan. Yeah, that's good. Okay, starting. To begin with, Daniel is fully anaesthetised while surgeons remove part of his skull. But once his brain is exposed, he's woken up and must be kept awake. Daniel, how are you feeling? Yeah, good. Excellent. You just need to be a bit careful at the back because that's close to where the part of your brain that moves the right-hand side of your body. Before removing each piece of tumour, Surgeons need to be sure it won't affect Daniel's speech or his ability to move his body. I'm going to show you some pictures now, Dan, OK? I want you to just say what you see. Say, so at each step, the team checks his responses. Well done, Dan. Part of Daniel's tumour will be sent for whole genome sequencing. Its entire DNA will be mapped. What that means is essentially we're looking at the abnormalities in the genes that we think cause the tumour in the first place. So we're really able to drill down into the molecular problems in the tumour. Daniel's diagnosis, his future, rests on what they find in these tubes. DNA sequencing used to take months, now it can be done in days. At these labs near Cambridge of US biotech Illumina, not only does it speed up diagnosis, but reveals what is driving the growth of a patient's cancer. Nothing can prepare a patient or a family for the nuclear bomb that detonates at the centre of your world when you receive a diagnosis. Jess lost her mother Tessa Jowell to brain cancer in 2018. The former Labour cabinet minister spent her last months campaigning for more funding and research into the condition. Brain cancer is the biggest cancer killer of children and people under 40 in the UK. Yet treatment options have not changed in decades. Because this is low grade... We Just know two weeks after surgery, Daniel returns to Addenbrooke's with his brother to receive his results. This is a diagnosis that is treatable, yeah. but it's not a curable condition. Okay. So this is something that will be life-limiting. About 50% of people survive for 15 years or more. But I think it's important that you understand this isn't something that's going to go away. Yeah. Wow. I don't know what to say. Sure. We don't have to say anything. Enjoy the next 15 years of my life. He's gone 2-0 to them. Oh. <laughs> A few weeks later, I joined Daniel to watch his local football team. The quality of finishing is shocking. He used to play in goal. Now he gives advice from the touchline. Life's very short, so I want to make the most of it. I just want to get the treatment I can to, to prolong my life, like six weeks of radiotherapy, five days a week. More than 200 brain tumour patients are taking part in the research with the hope it may eventually yield new, personalised treatments which improve outcomes. <laughs> Fergus Walsh, BBC News, Cambridge.
Well, joining me now is Jess Mills, who we saw in that film. She is a founding member of the Tessa Jowell Brain Cancer Mission, named after her late mother, Dame Tessa Jowell, who died, as we saw there, in, from brain cancer back in 2018. And this organisation provides funding for the study at the Cambridge Adam Brooks Hospital. Thank you so much for joining us, Jess. And um, it's lovely to see you. I should say your mother was wonderful. She was, she was a great friend to many of us who swirl around the sort of political scene and she was she was truly inspirational it's amazing to see that you've um carried on the work that she started can you just tell us a little bit about um the importance of this research why are you are you wanting to fund this work well um firstly thank you thank you so much for for having me um so this this program is, is actually not being funded by the Tessa Jail Brain Cancer Mission. It, it's a very wonderful story, actually, of how international collaboration can be a source for such brilliant progress in, in, in areas of tough challenge like this. The programme is being funded by one of the Tessa Jail Brain Cancer Mission's founding partners, the Mindaroo Foundation, um, who are a pioneering philanthropic um, foundation from Australia. Um, and um, but very much as part of our national strategy through the Tessa Jail Brain Cancer Mission to truly innovate NHS current treatment and care so that as per my mother's departing wish, every brain cancer patient can receive world-class treatment and care in their local hospital. And this, this is the beginning of that. And as I understand it, Jess, the, the point is to try and understand more about the mutations that drive a tumour and therefore to be able to help with treatment. That's right. So just to give you, I think it's probably helpful for me to describe what the current process is or what, what happened with mum, which, which speaks to the experience of every patient um, currently. So when you're diagnosed, you're told you have three options, surgery, radiotherapy or one chemotherapy, and that is it. You are also told simultaneously that those three options may extend your life by 14 months if you're lucky. Now, my mum was intolerant to the chemotherapy um, and so she couldn't even see herself through the first course of it. She died 11 months after she was diagnosed. Now, if this programme had been live when my mum was diagnosed, instead of that being the only options we could access through the NHS, she would have had her tumour deep comprehensively sequenced, the doctors would have understand much more, in much more detail what was driving her cancer and then they could have started thinking about some other options that could have had benefit for her. And, you know, I think it's important to say at this point we don't have one, one single agent that's going to make brain tumours go from, you know, being incurable to curable. But what we can do through this programme already is start to offer patients other options, which are maybe repurposed drugs from other, other cancers, which I tell you what, when you are given the news that my family was given, gives you this very, very important thing called hope. And hope is actually the thing that can enable you to make, you know, to, to make the unbearable bearable for the time that you have. Yeah, and I, I mean, I remember seeing your mum when she was ill and she, she told us about what, what had happened and how she first realised that she wasn't well. Will mm. this research in any way help understand what causes brain tumours? Yeah, so what's very, very powerful and important about precision medicine is that it fully integrates basic science all the way up to patient bedside care. So it really serves the full spectrum of the process. So it, it provides a very, very rich environment for scientists to learn about what's um, causing the cancer, what's driving the cancer. But it then up to the, to the bedside care of the patient, it enables doctors to give much, much more targeted um, treatment considerations for patients. So it really, really manages the whole spectrum, which is what's so powerful, uh, powerful about, about it. And it is the thing in time, uh, and not just for brain cancer, but for cancers more broadly. Precision medicine is the space in which, for many cancers, they will go from being incurable to in time treatable. That is something that obviously is, is such a massive focus. And, and when you say that your mother couldn't go on with the chemotherapy, what, what are the other options that might have been available to her or that are available now to other patients? 
So when my mum was diagnosed, um, as a result of the extensive work that she had done in public health for more than 50 years, when the news became known to friends and colleagues what her diagnosis was and, of course, what her prognosis was, we were just inundated with offers of advice, in, you know, informally advice and support from people, honestly, all over the world. And so this really formed the kind of, was the genesis of mum's campaign, was that as we were basically told we had no more treatment options left on the National Health Service, we were suddenly being inund inundated in this informal capacity by advice from people all over the world who were saying, if you can do X, Y, Z, you could get this treatment and this may well, you know, give you more time, there's lower toxicity. Um, you know, the, we were really, really introduced to some of the most cutting-edge stuff that was happening. And, and as everything that Mum did in her life, you know, she... She fought for, you know, 50 years of her career were basically, um, you know, framed around how she could tackle huge issues of inequality. And what she saw through that experience that, in her words, was absolutely despicable, that if you are a family who happens to have the privilege of these other um, these other options, you may well have a chance at living better or longer as a result of it. So at the very, very heart of this campaign is, is closing that inequality gap. So as mum would say, that every single patient in the, in the UK can receive world-class treatment in their local hospital. And that's what this, this programme is the beginning of. Yeah, and we hear so many families, don't we, looking internationally for solutions, but those solutions are often very, very expensive to access privately and some countries have got great records and, and others sadly haven't um mm. j just tell us what what the last few years have been like for your family as you you've had to accept um the loss of your mother but you're still focused obviously on this campaign oh i mean it's it, it's a loss of dimensions that it's possible it's impossible to fully articulate but for me what you know doing this work every day is my way, our way of keeping that incredibly unique, extraordinary brand of values and humanity that she had alive as a force for good in the world. And um, I tell you what, with the launch of this programme right now, I think she would be very, very proud of what we're, we're doing.